Hello, and thank you everyone for joining us today to celebrate our climate writer in residence, Katlia Lafferty. My name is Kendra Sakamoto, and I'm a librarian here at West Vancouver Memorial Library. Um, I would like to acknowledge that I am on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Squamish, tsleil and Musqueam Nations. I personally am extremely grateful to live in this beautiful place that the Coast Salish peoples have been the careful caretakers of since time immemorial. It has been an honor to spend these past three months working with Katlia and learning from those people who have always lived in harmony with the land. May we all remember to walk respectfully in the footsteps of those that came before us. Today, we are delighted to celebrate the residency that Katlia Lafferty is completing um, as we speak. This is the final event in this inaugural climate writer and residence position. And it's been so exciting to uh, work with Katlia and to have her engage with the community of West Vancouver over these past three months. Um, Katlia is a Northern Dene novelist from the Yellow Knives Dene First Nation. Her memoir, Northern Wildflower, was the top selling book in the Northwest Territories upon release and is used as a teaching tool in Indigenous literary studies across Turtle Island. Her recently released novel, Land, Water, Sky, was placed on the Scotia Bank Giller Prize Craving Can Lit List, was nominated for an Indigenous Voices Award, and is the 2022 recipient of the North Words Book Award. She is currently in her third year of the Juris Doctor in Common Law and Indigenous Legal Orders with the University of Victoria. Her forthcoming novel, This House is Not a Home, will be released this fall. And welcome, Katlia. Hello, thank you so much for that warm introduction, Kendra. Uh, so yes, my name is Katlia, that is my Dene name. I am from Samba K, Northwest Territories, Yellowknife. I was raised primarily by my grandmother, Alice Lafferty, who is Chippewan Dene and Klicho. And she was raised on um, an island called Nishi Island in the north arm of the Great Slave Lake, where she lived predominantly off the land until she was in her early 20s. She lived completely off-grid uh, with no running water, no electricity. She stored her food in the ground um, to keep it cold in the permafrost and washed her clothes in the lake. And it was at the time of the Hudson Bay uh, where she lived it was the first um, Hudson Bay trading post area in the Northwest Territories and her father was a trapper. So thank you so much um, for, to the library for inviting me to do this presentation. Um, so I'll be doing a run through of the different programs and projects that we have put on throughout the lifespan of the residency, starting with book clubs. Uh, we did a Tell Your Story program. We did the, an Indigenous climate panel, an elders workshop in Squamish community. I've uh, completed several blogs I've been in conversation with Monique Gray Smith, among other authors. I've done school visits, uh, and there's been quite a number of bonuses or what I call extras throughout this residency that I'll discuss. And last but not least, I have been able to focus on some of my own writing, um, which includes my upcoming novel, This House is Not a Home. So for the Braiding Sweetgrass Book Club, uh, which I don't have a book of right now because I've lent it out, it's such a beloved book. Um, Robin Wall Kimmerer really takes us on a journey of her personal experience um, as a botanist, but also as someone who grew up on the land and had a connection to the land from her indigenous um, perspective and, and background. And so we really discussed um, several themes throughout the book that related to climate change, including the honorable harvest and the importance of that. Um, and then we invited local Souk elder Jeff Welsh to attend the circle and talk to us about cedar as he is a harvester um, in his area and he knows all about cedar and and how to harvest it and how to um, weave and create beautiful um, roses and all kinds of things out of cedar. So he really gave us a treat by um, participating and being our feature elder. And also Kendra, uh, one of the librarians, she um, 
was able to collect seashells with her children and um, also bring in some sweet grass for the participants. And we created bundles that included uh, seashells from the territory that we are living on and um, the sweet grass and the cedar that was provided by Jeff. And we were able to give those away as gifts. Then next we did the Indigenomics Book Club and I do have a copy here in front of me. And as you can see, I've got it all um, posted up on the important pages that really talk about climate change um, from an Indigenous lens again. Carol Ann Hilton is a local author to the island here. And we had a great discussion. It was a smaller group, but we had a great discussion about the intersection between climate change and the economy and what it's really gonna take to make a big shift um, from where we are now to um, an economy that really devotes and protect to the protection of the environment and, and what it would look like for Indigenous peoples to take a true authentic seat at the economic table in order to address um, climate initiatives. Then we did um, probably one of my favorite projects, which was the Tell Your, Sto Tell Your Story program, um, Nature is Character. So from saving the trees in the Amazon to chameleons, gorillas, wheat fields, glaciers, fish, bears, wolves, and significant temperature changes, um, a group of children came together to create an anthology that is going to cover many aspects of climate change in the eyes of this small group of aspiring young authors. And they've crafted clever, beautiful masterpieces all on their own, albeit with a little bit of help from myself and Rhiannon from the library. Um, we gave them some helpful suggestions and prompts along the way. Um, there were 13 participants in total, ranging from ages 8 to 13, and they worked so hard on their stories in such a short amount of time. We only had four days over the spring break for them to really start off their stories from idea um, through the development process. And all along the way, they were very engaged and excited about how their stories were progressing. Um, some students opted to hand draw illustrations, such as this one here. And they've also uh, submitted graphic designs, which have really informed um, the cover and the pages within. So it was a joy to be a part of this experience and really help guide young learners and young authors to the Tell Your Story program in their journey of exploring what nature as character really means for them and giving voice to nature through writing. Um, they were able to really capture and portray the scope of the project successfully. Um, they were also able to learn some helpful tips on how to take care of themselves if they are experiencing climate anxiety and what they can do in playing their part in protecting the environment. So all that to say, um, the book will be coming out shortly. Rhiannon is working on it now as we speak, and the children have collectively decided to name it Nature Rules, which I think is a great title. So one of the last programs that we did with the residency was the Indigenous Climate Change Panel, where we asked a group of local knowledge experts from across the nation to come together and talk about some in-depth conversation around the issues that we're seeing in community um, in terms of climate change and what we can do about it, some of the solutions. Um, so we had Indigenous climate activists like Brandy Morin, um, Panic Pack Letitia Pokiak, and Dr. Nicole Redvers, who is also from the Northwest Territories. Um, and we really listened to how their their perspectives on the uh, fight against the climate crisis from an Indigenous perspective. Brandy Morin is a trained journalist who actually just recently returned from Europe where she was a part of the congregation that uh, went to seek an apology from the Pope for the residential school systems. Um, and she to told us quite a lot of uh, great information, including giving us a glimpse into her latest book. Um, and we had um, Buddy Joseph, who is a uh, husband to Chief Janice George um, from the Squamish Nation, uh, which we were great to have him. He is a local knowledge expert with plenty of um, knowledge from community. And then we had Dr. Nicole Redvers, who is the author of The Science of the Sacred, Connecting the Health of the Land to the Health of Oneself and Our Communities. And 
Panikpak Leticia Pokiak, who is from Tuktoyaktuk, Northwest Territories. Um, and she is an Inuit anthropologist who recently won a very prestigious award for her meaningful uh, research on consultation when it comes to industrial development. And the questions that we asked were, what compelled them to contribute their knowledge in a wider capacity to the protection of the land and water, plants and animals? And in what ways are they able to share their teachings that can help others join the fight of climate justice and awareness of global warming? And lastly, how in their view does the economy and the impacts of colonization contribute to climate change? Okay, so next, together with the Squamish Nation Climate Action Strategy Team, we were able to host a climate theme sharing circle where we invited elders to share their knowledge of the land and their thoughts on how we can protect the land for generations to come. We asked questions like, how have the land and waters changed in your lifetime? What did you learn from elders about caring for the land? How is climate change impacting your community? And what do you want your grandchildren to know so that they may steward the land for the next seven generations? What we heard was the importance of the Capilano River and how they were once able to drink directly from the river where they can't now. And in Squamish, we heard that they need support in their fight against encroachment on their lands. So for the blogs, um, I do have to admit that I had a bit of a hard time condensing the importance of the climate emergency into just a few short paragraphs. And so I think I really tasked um, the um, Kishel to really have to edit out uh, quite a bit and prioritize what, what needed to go out um, into the world. So um, I've done bi-weekly blogs, uh, one called A Time of Great Change, another one called Women in the Climate Crisis, one about the need for water, and one about protecting the public interest. And there are two more to come, um, one that will be wrapping up my residency. Next, we had a conversation with Monique Grace Smith, local author here in Lekwungen Territory, on her adaptation of braiding sweetgrass. She is going to be... Um, she is in the process right now of adapting braiding sweetgrass into a young adult read um, and she's doing great work it was a really engaging conversation to really get behind the scenes of what it's like to have to do that type of work and she's given us a sneak peek into the book which should be out in the fall of this year and then i did some school visits all online, of course, um, but nonetheless, they were very engaging. I met with Capilano University students um, who were in their first year of journalism school and talked to them about some tips and tricks to good reporting. I uh, helped them to get excited about pitching on climate issues to bring education and awareness to the subject and how to make it a priority in their work and in the news. Then I met with grade six Westcott elementary students who had really great questions and sometimes put me on the spot with their very specific science oriented questions. So good to them, good on them. Next for the bonuses and extras, there were so many to list, but a few that I've decided to place here are um, the fact that Surrey Catholic High School art students had requested to draw my portrait which was very flattering. Um, the Federation of Teachers of BC have asked me to contribute to their next um, magazine for climate change um, article that centers around the importance of place-based teachings. And um, I will be extending my visit with um, Elder uh, Jeff Welsh out in Souk. Um, in the next few weeks where I will be accompanying him when he gathers his cedar and I will be filming the process so that we can share it with the library on Truth and Reconciliation Day. So you can look out for that as well. Um, I was also invited to an Nanaimo Elders Literary Circle where I got to sit with a group of women who told me about um, the changes that they have seen on the land similar to the workshops with the Elders in Squamish Nation and that was really great to be a part of that as they are a group of um, willing learners who um, do not know how to read or write but really are um, actively um, 
uh, attending classes, literacy classes to, to do that work and to learn. Um, then I was asked by the United Church to do a talk on the um, intersection between climate change and religion, which I found very, uh, very fruitful conversation. And lastly, um, very exciting news from Cook McDermott Agency. Um, Stephanie Sinclair, a literary agent, reached out to me after having heard that I was a climate writer in residence here and asked me to um, put together a proposal for a nonfiction book that will um, pretty much gather up a lot of the work that I've done throughout this residency, talking about climate change from an Indigenous perspective, um, because I don't think that there's that much um, literature out there on that subject, and it's a very important um, factor to um, make sure to include when talking about climate change. And Lastly, for the extras, I got to meet with a woman named Linda France in London, who is the only other climate writer in residence that we know of in the world. Uh, we got to sit down over Zoom and discuss our um, emotions about being tasked with this responsibility of being a climate writer and what that's like for us. And we've decided to go forth and write um, poetry to each other in the form of letters. Um, where we will do this over time and share with the library and share with other um, outlets that are willing to publish our poetry. And I actually wanted to read a little snippet of the first letter that she wrote to me. When I settle down to start the first letter to you in Canada, the wind follows me indoors. The empty hearth gushes with down draught, our chimney pot a mouthpiece of the sky flute, blowing my ears full of it rinsed of any thought. Tell me how it is where you are, how you are touched by the changes in the weather and the work you do, this intractable task we share of minting sentences for what can't be said, spinning a new language out of the old, closer to the land under our feet. Here in my hand, I look it up 4,500 miles apart. And last but not least, I am sharing with you a sneak peek of my next novel, This House is Not a Home. And the cover is actually not available uh, for public viewing yet. So um, this is the first that any of the public has seen the cover. And I am going to read a little bit of this book for you. It, I'll, leading up to that, I guess I could so This House is Not a Home is centered around the housing system, particularly in the Northwest Territories um, and the issues with the housing system. And the main character, Ko, uh, for the setup of what I'm about to read, he is very conflicted having to live in housing. All he wants to do is to be able to live back out on the land, um, but he has to work to pay the bills to live um, in a unit that he does not want to live in. Um, that he was dispossessed from the land and forced to assimilate and have to live in housing. So this is his um, rendition of um, what he's going through and having to work in a mind that, he, um, that goes against everything that he believes in. The pressure of having to find a way to pay bills was too much for Ko and he gave in. No longer could he tinker around and help in the community for free. He had to bring money into the household. With C working to make ends meet, it was only right that he contribute to. But each minute he spent down in those cramped, dark tunnels, surrounded by the oldest rocks in the world, named after his only son, was unsettling. The cold, damp, hollow mine shaft only served as a reflection of how he felt inside, and it didn't take long for the conflict to show up in his body. He was sore all the time. Every joint, ligament, and bone ached. Even when he was at home, he couldn't get away from work. From his partially thawed living room window, steamed in condensation from the heat of the wood stove that he illegally installed to lower the cost of the heat bill after their power was shut off, Co had a miserable view of the old wooden mine shaft. Its rickety and decrepit looking frame stood like a curse across the lake, destroying what was once an uninterrupted view. He could never understand how such an entity, such a force, could do so much damage by human hands. The land had been turned into a money-making machine driven by greed, 
In his mind, the mine was a murderer. The manpower behind it gave it its strength, but it seemed to have taken on a life of its own. Ko knew that the constant taking could never allow for nature to coexist. The mine was disruptive in every way imaginable, and it could only lead to a place there was no coming back from. The passage of time proved that Ko was right about one thing. The mine was a force so powerful that it set out on a rampage of murders that no one could stop. Mine production was not carefully maintained and the pollution coming out of the smokestacks landing on the banks of creeks began to kill off the animals first. Workers reported seeing entire schools of fish floating in the creeks. Mallards turned up dead, their eggs not able to hatch. Even a family of beavers were found rigor mortis near a dam. All had the markings of poisoning. Even the scavengers let, left them alone, sniffing out a sickness that humans couldn't. With all these findings, still the mine didn't stop production. Mine management turned a blind eye to what was happening to the animals whose habitats happened to be in the vicinity. It was only when the ravens started dropping from the sky in town that people started to question why. Falling from the sky, the front page of the newspaper read with a picture of a dead bird on the ground. It was common to see the odd dead raven on the ground next to a power pole, zapped by the electrical current and causing the power all over the town to go out, but this was different. Mine workers knew that the ravens were eating the leftover lunch they had tossed onto the ground behind the cafeteria, left to rot into the soil. The ravens had set up their nests under the ledges of some of the higher buildings, like the mine shaft itself, for easy access to food scraps. When the ravens started coming into town, though, they were sending a message that something wasn't right. Abandoning their nest, they came by the thousands, darkening the sky in the middle of the day with their black wings. They perched on the main government building, making a mess of the siding. It got to be so bad that the government workers could no longer work with constant squawking, and janitors were tasked with cleaning up ladders, climbing up ladders to install spikes so that the ravens wouldn't land on the windowsills before before ugh, before falling mysteriously to their death on the sidewalk below. Next, it was the fish. When Ko checked his traps, he was turning up bug-eyed looking fish in the bay near the mine, some with only one eye or three gills, some filled with a bright green slime and an overwhelming odor seeping from their stomachs when cut open. Ko brought one home to show C after turning up more than one. I think we should report this. I've tried, they won't listen, Ko said. People are going to get sick if they eat this, she said as she held her nose closed from the stench of the deformed fish laid out on the table in front of her on a black garbage bag. I'm throwing it back, one of the quitti from town's bound to report it. From now on, we don't eat fish until we figure out what's going on. Do you think? C didn't want to say it, but she looked out at the mine in accusation. I don't know what to think anymore. I sure as hell hope not, but what else could it be? Ko took in a deep breath. If it is, do you think they'll shut it down? Not a chance. So stay tuned for This House Is Not A Home. Uh, it will be published with Fernwood Roseway in print in, I believe, August of this year. And that's it for this presentation. Um, there's a few photos of the actual giant mine um, that is actually a very contaminated mine, probably the most contaminated mine in the world, sitting on 325 tons of inorganic arsenic that many people do not know what to do with. Um, otherwise, I mean, I don't want to end it on a doom and gloom note, but I want to say thank you so much to the library for um, putting this important, important residency on. I hope it continues on. I hope this is just the start. I hope that libraries all over Turtle Island um, tune in and, and realize how important libraries are in bridging connection to community and to addressing the climate initiative and climate change um, far and wide. I mean, it doesn't, it's not only left to uh, government officials to make the changes that need to be made. Um, libraries and schools and all sorts of organizations can also be helping to do this work. And just kudos to the library for doing such an amazing job um, in getting this going. And I just wanna say thank, a special thank you to Kendra Sakamoto, uh, Rhiannon, Rhiannon Wallace, and everyone else that's helped make this such a great residency for me. And I just, I'm so thankful, Masicho. 
All right, thank you, Katlia, so much for that incredible presentation. It's been wonderful to relive all of the amazing work that you've done over the past three months. Um, I have especially appreciated this residency because you've spent so much time focusing on the solutions. So rather than focusing on the very overwhelming and oftentimes scary problems, you've really brought out solutions and given so much advice on what we can be doing. Um, especially hearing from the youth and the, the school classes that you've worked with. It's been really inspiring to hear what the youth are, are thinking on this topic. Um, so I'm just wondering, as we move forward, what recommendation do you have for the community of West Vancouver? Well, I think you really just said it. I think we really need to listen to our youth at this point. Our youth are engaged and they know, they understand um, what is happening when it comes to climate change, they're innovative thinkers. They're not afraid to um, think outside of the box. And right now that's what we really need. And we need to um, educate our, our parents on, you know, how important it is to recycle and to compost and to um, reduce our, our usage of energy and, and look to solutions that we can do on our own such as walking or biking to work, small things like that, or making sure to turn the light out when you leave the room. So it's not out of our hands completely. We definitely can um, do our part in every way we live our daily life, but we can also hold our um, leaders to task as well. And, and one way to do that is to really get on the side of Indigenous nations because they are doing that work right now. Thank you. Um, and because we are a library, of course, our final question, what are three books that everyone should be reading right now? Well, I in fact have them right here in front of me. Um, the first one that is up for some awards I just heard recently is Lushim's Plants, Traditional Indigenous Foods, Materials and Medicines, written by Dr. Lushim Arvid Charlie and Nancy J. Turner. So you can get this at the library. It's a beautiful book with just great, vibrant, vivid photos throughout. It's beautiful. Then we have Fresh Banana Leaves that I'm currently reading right now. I love it so much. I've been dog earing the pages, which I know is uh, some people would not like that. Um, this is written by Jessica Hernandez, Dr. Jessica Hernandez. And it's just, it's a great read. Um, really talks about the um, Indigenous science and the healing Indigenous landscapes all across uh, not only Turtle Island but internationally as well. And then we have Ground Swell. Um, it's an Indigenous knowledge and call to action for climate change edited by Joe Neidhart and Nicole Neidhart and this is really I think similar to what I'm going to be trying to achieve with um, Stephanie Sinclair at McDermott Agency, something that is very interactive uh, for readers to um, really engage themselves on, on this paradigm shift that we're really trying to achieve here um, through climate change initiatives. So those are my three top picks. Excellent, and we do of course have all three of those books at the library. Um, again, thank you, Katlia, so much for this incredible residency. It's been truly an honor to work with you, and it's been so much fun to watch you engage with the community. Um, and of course, because of the virtual world, we've been able to reach people outside of West Vancouver as well, which has been really special. Um, and I'm just very grateful to you for your time and for these past three months that we've gotten to spend together. Um, to everyone watching, if you're watching this video, you um, are eligible to win a prize. We have some book prizes available. So check out our website or our social media networks or social media platforms to um, see how to enter the contest and you can win a climate themed book as well as um, a medicine bundle that Katlia and I put together. So be sure to check that out so you can enter the contest. Um, Katlia has a couple more blogs and all of her blogs are still available on our website and some of the programs she has done throughout her residency are available on our YouTube channel. So make sure you check out our website to find all of those things. And we look forward to seeing you in the library. And again, Katlia, thank you so much. Uh, it's truly been an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye.